Hi, my name is Mylon Lefevre, and music is in my blood. I got my first big break when Elvis Presley recorded a song I'd written at 17 years old. That moment changed my life forever. I went from having nothing to having my dreams come true. I toured the world and played with some of the biggest names in music and had more money than I knew what to do with. I finally hit rock bottom when I almost died from a drug overdose, and it became painfully obvious something had to change. Everything did change when I gave my life to Jesus at a second chapter of Acts concert in 1980. God instantly delivered me from drugs and totally turned my life around. I began to use my gift of music for the Lord and started a Christian band, Mylon and Broken Heart. It eventually grew to be one of the biggest Christian rock bands in the world at the time. We won several Grammys and Dove Awards, but most importantly, we led over 200,000 kids to Christ. Now, years later, I'm still living for Jesus and my wife, Christy, and I travel the globe proclaiming God's goodness. I've been from rock bottom to the mountaintop and I'm going all the way to heaven. So come on and join me on the road to freedom. Welcome to On the Road to Freedom. We're so glad you joined us today. As you can see, it's the end of the day and we're in Maui. As you know, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you'll know the truth, and the truth that you know, it'll make you my disciples, and it will make, make you free. free. Yeah. So we're going to share some truth with you. We got an opportunity, uh, I guess it was a few years ago now, but we got the footage, and we want to show it. We were at a prison. It's called Hutchins Prison. Yeah. It's in Texas. It was an awesome time awesome with was. Michael and Sherry Howell and Go Deep doing yeah. the worship. We're awesome. going to show you some of that today. You're going to really love it. Most of all, you're going to love seeing what God does in those prisoners. So check it out, and I'll talk to you in a few. We're going to have some fun tonight. <clears throat> I believe that Christians ought to have more fun than anybody else. I mean, come on, this is a no-brainer, y'all. If you're going to heaven, you ought to be in a better mood than if you're going to hell. Come on, let me see some teeth up in here. Yeah. Now, I appreciate y'all getting out. I appreciate y'all coming out tonight. I remember I never went to prison, but I did spend a little time behind bars. And I remember thinking, I don't care if they just giving out chicken lips. If I get a chance to get out of here, I'm getting out. <laughs> so, I mean, I know everybody ain't here because you want to go to church, but I'm glad you came. And we're going go to we're gonna have a little church up in here, but it's going to be fun church. I grew up in a church where it wasn't fun all the time. My granddad is a preacher. And I'm almost 70 years old, so I'm talking about back in the day. Some of y'all ain't going to have a clue what I'm fixing to tell you about. But back in the day when I was a kid, I lived in Georgia, and uh, I was born in 1944. So, you know, I was a teenager in the 50s, 55, 56, 57, right in there. And I was starting to write songs, and I was a little guy, I mean, a little, little bitty guy. And uh, when you write songs, when you write down stuff that rhymes, the other guys on the football team will question your masculinity. Anybody know what I'm talking about up in there? And when you're a little guy, you try to fight back, but you ain't doing a whole lot. And you get, you know, people making fun of you. But when I was 17, Elvis cut one of my songs. Y'all do remember Elvis. And uh, he was the uh, king of rock and roll in those days. And we were born on the other side of the tracks. Anybody in here grow up Poe? Now, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I ain't talking about poor. If you were poor, you don't know nothing about Poe. We was Poe. We, we had some roaches in our trailer, man, it's big enough where a cowboy has. You wake up in the morning, these socks be going down. The Whoa, dude. Socks be going down the road. So when you grow up poor and all of a sudden somebody records one of your songs, you ain't never done, the only thing anybody ever did was make fun of you for writing songs. And then one day, this guy cuts one. I never had a car. I, and and uh, you don't get a whole lot of dates on a bicycle. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, my social life was uh, zero. And so I joined the Army right out of high school and I'm, I'm in the Army, it's 1962. I'm in the Army making $84 a month, and Elvis cuts one of my songs. And right after that, Johnny Cash. And I see the train a-coming. Thank you, thank you very much. So, all of a sudden, man, all I'll tell you is this. I won't tell you how much the check was for, but I will tell you this. I went and bought a, a new Harley, 
And by the way, a Harley in 1962 was $1,800 brand new. I bought a Corvette, 427 cubic inch, just a redneck dream, set it to red light going, blah, 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 blah. Want some of this? Anybody want some of this? Blah, 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 blah. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm King Kong. And one day I bought a Harley, a Corvette, um, a guitar, two pair of Levi's and some leather Converse All-Stars on a Thursday. That's what I'm talking about. Now see, I thought I was free. I thought if you made enough money where you could do what you want to, and I never wanted any more than that. I thought if, if a man gets that, he's King Kong. You know what I mean? You, you, the girls that wouldn't ever talk to me in high school, they hang out with you. You got a new vet in my hood. <laughs> they ride on your Harley. So I, I get up, I grow up in church, you know, I'm in, how many of y'all been to church? How many of y'all, I mean, I grew up in church, and it, I was just totally confused. I mean, my, my granddad was a preacher, my mom and daddy sung gospel music, and by the way, wasn't that amazing, man, that band, Go Deep, awesome, awesome, awesome. We do, we're really good friends and we do videos together. We do stuff, me and Michael and Sherry and my wife on the, the blind there, we get on our motorcycles. Come here, baby. Hey. Oh yeah. This is an honor for us. Yes, and we're thankful for Mike Barber Ministries and Proclaim Ministries, thank you. You know, this is an honor, and we have great expectation. And, you know, I just want you to know, I live with Mylon 24-7. We do everything together, and everything he's going to share with you tonight, I see him live. He does live and walk what he preaches. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, you know, I've, I've really seen the Father. It reminds me of Colossians 1.13 says that the Father has delivered us out of the control and the dominion of darkness. Come on. And Mylon's been delivered again, from the bondage. I've seen Mylon's been delivered from that bondage of fear and anger and addiction and been transferred. And what God did for him, he wants to do for you. Yeah. And been transferred, amen, into the kingdom of the son of his love. You know, the kingdom of God, it's a kingdom of love. And that's our prayer for you tonight, that the truth of God's word would be revealed to you yeah. and also how much he loves you. And you know, the last 33 years, Mylon's been enjoying the abundant life in Christ, the good life. And that's what God has for you. He has a good life for you. Amen. So we're excited. <laughs> so honey, I love you and we're thankful to be here. And believe, we believe the best is yet to come for you guys. Amen. So God bless you. Thanks, baby. Thank you. <clears throat> Amen. Well, what I started to tell you a while ago um, was that I grew up in church, and yet later on I, I got in a band. You know, I, I took the money from the Elvis cut and bought some gear and got with some of my buddies, and I was writing songs because that's just I was a pretty shy guy. When something was really important to me, I couldn't tell somebody uh, certain things. I just wasn't confrontational by nature. And uh, so I would write a song about that situation and I'd play it for that person and hope they got it and hope they figured it out it's for them, you know. But I didn't really mean to start a band or anything. I just, uh, after Elvis cut that song, other people said, well, you got any more songs? And I'm like, hey, give me 20 minutes. What do you want one about, you know? <laughs> Come on, somebody. I mean, I, I figured it up. I mean, I ain't the sharpest guy, you know, I, but, but I know I figured up when I got that Elvis check, I can either write another song or I can stay in the army another 600 years. I got a choice here. My career, what am I going to do here? So, you know, here's the deal. I went to church as a kid, not because I love Jesus, but because my daddy was bigger than me. And my daddy's a big old country boy from Tennessee. I was just neck glow in the dark at night. I mean, we're talking about red neck. And, uh, and, and in those days, y'all young ones ain't gonna know nothing about this, but it, there was a time when you couldn't sue your daddy for whooping you. 
And in, in fact, in those days, if they'd have told my daddy that's child abuse, my daddy would have whooped the judge. <laughs> you know, because that's just, he didn't negotiate with his kids. So, um, and he didn't, you know, we went to church all the time. Daddy didn't quote no scripture at my house, except one. If you spare the rod, you spoil the child. I do remember, I had that memorized by six or seven years old. So I went to church, we went to church, man, and every time the door opened, man, my granddad's a preacher, so my mama sat on the front row, and whoever, the, in other words, five of us kids, when I was the smallest, I had to sit next to mama. Because if you got rowdy in church, she'd give you an elbow and let you know that's one. If you got three elbows, that meant I'm telling daddy, and now you're in the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't even... After you get two elbows, don't even breathe the rest of the service. Just... <laughs> so, I'm going to church, right? We went to Pentecostal. Anybody know anything about Pentecostal church? I mean, it was wild. I'm a little kid, man. I'm sitting there, and, and granddaddy's preaching. And granddaddy, it was like this weird thing happened to him when he went in the pulpit. He didn't, you know, if he's over at his house, he's just a guy, you know. Hey, Grandma, pass me the biscuits. He's real normal. But it's like a Jekyll and Hyde, something, you know. He'd get in the pulpit, and he'd go, bless God. I'm going down to the river. <laughs> you know, and he'd go, and it's like, who's that? I'm thinking, what happened to Grandpa? He freaks out every Sunday. <laughs> and I'd be wondering, and, and he'd be preaching, and you know, in those days, didn't have no air conditioning, so everybody had them funeral fans. Man, in Georgia, it'd be 110 degrees, everybody sweating like a dog in there, man, with them funeral fans. And so I, I'd look around every once in a while, just trying to stay out of trouble. And I remember that there was certain things that happened. Once granddaddy, he'd start out talking, and then he'd start to get that rhythm thing going. And then he'd start in, you know, and he'd become that other guy. And when he started that, somehow he would wake up screaming guy. If you, you must have went to a Baptist church. You don't know nothing about screaming guy. He was about 80 years old. I don't know what his real name was. I never met him. But he screamed every service. He only did it once, but he slept most of the time. So you never, you'd, you'd get relaxed, you know? You'd forget he's going to do it, and you'd get real relaxed. About that time, Grandpa would get to huffing and puffing and wake him up, and then he'd realize, man, it's Sunday, and I ain't screamed yet. Yeah! <laughs> and when Grandpa screamed, that's when Running Man took off. Now he's doing loud. And when, and when Running Man, well, look out now. When Running Man took off, that's when Chicken Woman jumped up and started. Woo! 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 And it was on then. It's that man for himself. So I'm like five years old, right? I'm sitting next to Mama. I don't want that third elbow. I'm just trying to get through this thing. I don't want nobody to land on me. It's happened before. I'm looking at chicken woman thinking, what is the matter with you woman? <laughs> Gonna be rolling up under my seat. Now, some of this stuff is funny now, but it wasn't funny then. It scared the stuff out of me. <laughs> so one day, and I, again, I don't know what chicken woman's name, I just know that's what us kids called her. You know, because she looked like a chicken to me. <laughs> and so I said to mama one day, I made the mistake of saying, Mama, what makes chicken woman act like that? <laughs> and Mama said, son, don't make fun of the Holy Ghost, it's blasphemy. <laughs> I said, what's blasphemy, Mama? She said, it's the unforgivable sin. <laughs> I'm thinking, my God, I'm on my way to hell and I ain't but six. <laughs> it's too late. I've already done it. Now, the good news is I wasn't making fun of the Holy Ghost. I was making fun of chicken woman. And that was good for me to find out, but it was years later. It was years later that I found out that the one thing I needed the most 
was the thing the devil had scared me out of asking God for. I told God, I don't want to go to hell. I believe there's a God. I believe Jesus is his son. I want to go to heaven. But uh, if it's all right with you, I'm going to pass on that Holy Ghost deal there because uh, I don't want to be at school, you know, talking to my girlfriend and all of a sudden, whoo, 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 you know, it, it scared me. So the devil had tricked this little kid into being afraid of the spirit of God. And let me tell you something. You can't live holy. You, you're not going to, if you're going to change your life, if you're going to have a good quality of life, and that is the will of God for you guys. It is not the will of God for you to have your freedom taken away from you. It is not the will of God for you to have your liberty taken away from you. We've all made bad choices. Later on in life, I got out of high school. I went in and got my buddies. We made some records and, and just a little studio chicken wired together. We didn't have any real money, but we, you know, got some time and we'd buy like enough time to do one song demo. And then some record company picked us up in 1969. And all of a sudden we're on the radio and people started liking it. And then we're out opening shows for the who and the stones and traffic and 10 years after. And, and, uh, I mean, unless this is way back in the day. So you young ones ain't going nothing about this, but one of the Beatles played on one of my records, and trust me, the Beatles were a big band. One of the Rolling Stones, Clapton and Dylan and Elton John and, and uh, Little Richard and, and just a whole bunch of folks y'all would know playing on my music. And all of a sudden, I'm out playing in big stadiums and stuff and, and making a little money, and things seem to be going good. And, I was in a studio called The Record Plant in New York City, and Steve Stills was in one of them. They had three studios there. One of them was Steve Stills, and he was, he was away from Crosby, Stills, and Nash at the time. He had a band called Manassas, and they were making a record in one studio. John and Yoko, John Lennon and Yoko Ono was, were doing an album on Yoko. It was a screaming album. I hope you never got it. It gave you a headache, boy. It was bad. And uh, we were in the other one with Felix Paparotti, who was my producer. He had a band called Mountain. And, uh, and I saw some people passing around some white powder. And they had a $100 bill and they snorting this white powder. And I thought, well, they, invite, they passed it to me. And so I, I, I took some and I thought, that's nice. And I stayed up with those guys. We stayed up and, and uh, for the first time, I went through two or three days at a time. And I quit living every 24 hours and I started, you know, I had me some hundred dollar bills and I brought me some magic dust and, and I started staying up two or three days at a time. And then I'd take some quaaludes and, some, you know, knock myself, not really sleep, but just go unconscious for 18 or 20. And then I'd go for another three days. I got strung out and sold a few million records, made a few million dollars, but I, I almost lost my soul in that thing. And I was losing the battle. I got strung out on heroin, and uh, it almost killed me. I was doing a record in England. George Harrison, who was in the Beatles, married a girl whose sister was married to Mick Fleetwood from Fleetwood Mac. And so Mick came over and became my drummer. So we had Ian Wallace from King Crimson. You older guys will know some of these bands. Um, uh, Mick Fleetwood on drums, and we had Boz Burrell from Bad Company on bass. We had Steve Winwood from Traffic on keyboards. We had a guy named Rebop who was from Traffic, who was from Trinidad on percussion. It was a really good band. Uh, Alvin Lee, Ronnie Woods from the Rolling Stones, and George Harrison on guitars, and I was the lead singer. Things were going good, and then I OD'd. They found me not breathing. The only reason they found out I wasn't breathing is because the cigarette had burnt down to my skin, and my, they smelt my flesh burning. How close to hell is that? So they jerked me and I got to breathe in again, but they had to take me to the hospital and the, the blood had not gotten to my mind and, and the oxygen hadn't gotten to my mind. And after I OD'd, I couldn't even remember the words to the songs I'd written. And I was in this band that was a super group. It was 1971, everything was going great. And all of a sudden I couldn't be in a band anymore. I was just like spaced out and I couldn't remember, you know, I just couldn't figure things out. And my whole life just went from rocking and reeling to nothing. People forget you fast. Yeah? And I didn't know what to do, but I went to a concert 
by a band called the Second Chapter of Acts in Atlanta, Georgia in 1980. And they gave an invitation that night. And for the first time in my life as an adult, I was 35 years old at the time, I decided to give my life to Jesus. Now, I'd given him my problem. What, what, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me tell you this, this is important. This is really important. I had always believed there was a God from the time I was a little kid. I never had any doubt of that because I'd seen his power at work at times. I'd seen him do things nobody could do. And he had communicated with me in, in ways that let me know that he heard my prayers. I always knew that Jesus was his son. I never doubted that one time. And yet I went through life and just got away from my family, away from the church, away from all that stuff that I thought was confusing. And it was confusing to me because when you're a little kid, you know, grandpa, the preachers would say stuff to each other and they treat you like you're stupid because you're a little kid, but you still got ears. And you might not understand everything intellectually, but you still know what's right and wrong. And when you see chicken woman doing her thing on Sunday and then you find out she's been doing something else on Friday night, those two things, wait a minute now, what's up here? Is, is this from God or is what's up with this on Friday night and Saturday in here? And so I just decided, you know what, there's a God and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just beg him for mercy and I'm going to try my best to get to heaven. But, you know, I'm going to just ask him to cut me some slack and I'm going to do the best I can. And so I ignored God and that's what got me in all that trouble. When I finally got to that place, they gave this invitation. They said, does anybody want to make Jesus Lord? They didn't ask me if I wanted to get saved. I'm just sitting out there in the crowd, big audience, man. I was back in the back and in, in, in the dark place so nobody could see me. And the, and the guy standing up there giving the invitation said this. He said, I ain't asking you if you want to believe in Jesus Christ. I'm, he said, I'm asking you, do you trust him enough to make him the Lord and master of your life? Because he said, there's people out here that you ask him to forgive you of your sins, and he did. But you just keep on doing them. You're the Lord of your own life. You do what you want to, when you want to, and you, you beg God to fix it. And, and he said, I just believe there's somebody up in here that's tired of it. And just sick and tired of being sick and tired and man he was god was talking to me and i accepted jesus that night not only as the son of god and my savior but of as my lord and master and i surrendered i surrendered everything now at that time i was making eight or ten grand a day and i quit that job in rock and roll and i became a janitor at my church and I'm not telling you that because I'm some hero. I mean, I was either the dumbest guy on the planet or I ain't going to hell anymore. And that was a good deal for me. Amen. I became a janitor. They started paying me $175 a week. Now, and I was, a, I was a toilet cleaner. And by the way, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I didn't, I didn't do the chicken. And, uh, you know, I don't scream and holler in church and I don't bless God. You know, there's a lot I don't do, but there's some stuff I do. I'm weird too. Everybody is. Any of y'all think you're normal. You remember the normal ones are the ones that go postal. <laughs> you got to watch the normal ones. They are dangerous. We that know we're weird, we sort of keep an eye on it. You know what I mean? We know, whoa, I could break out any minute now. I better straighten up here. So here's the deal. I decided that night, you know what, I've been around the world at fast, I mean at high speed. I have peeked over the edge and it didn't kill me. It was close, but it didn't kill me. I got away with some stuff and I'm just gonna be straight with y'all. I ought to be sitting out there wearing white. I just didn't get caught. I'd tell you what I did, but there's a statute of limitations. <laughs> <laughs> And I ain't no lawyer, so I'm leaving that alone, you know. I gave my life to Jesus that night. Not my problems, not the stuff I was ashamed of and the stuff I got caught at and the stuff that I, you know, was, couldn't handle. I'm talking about my life. Now, ha, let, let me ask you, I started asking you this a while ago. How many of y'all... You went to church sometime in your life. Come on, let me see your hands. You went to church. How many of y'all believe there is a God? All right. How many of y'all, how many of y'all, put, put them down, please. How many of y'all believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? All right, cool, cool. All right. I got one last question. By the way, don't get mad at me because he told me to ask you this. 
How's that working for you? I'm going to ask you a straight up question now. Because if the quality of your life, God loves you. He loves me. I'm his child. He wants me. If you, y'all, any of y'all got any kids that you love? Now, if you don't like your kids, put your hands down. I mean, if you, that was a trick question. That was a dirty trick right there. If you love your kids, you want to do good stuff for them. The Bible says we're made in the image of God. If I want to, I got a daughter, man. She's 44 years old, but she's my kid. And you know what? You know, she's married to a Christian guy and thank God he's good to her. Because if he wasn't, me and him have to come to Jesus meeting because I'm daddy. You know what I mean? You can't stop being daddy. When, when you're daddy, you don't want nobody messing with your kids. Let me tell you something. God don't like the devil messing with his kids. Whoa, that was amazing. Praise yes, God, was. man. Praise I love God. it when the word goes forth. Yes. You know, Jesus said, I was in prison and you visited me. Yes. He said, when you do something unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. You bring yeah. somebody a drink of water when they're thirsty, you take care of an orphan, you go into a prison, whatever you do in the name of the Lord for his people, mm -hmm. you do it for him. For him. So Team Mylon, that's for you, man. When you see these people getting saved, we couldn't yeah, have done it without yeah. you. We love you guys. We're going to be back with part two next week. I'll see you then. In the meantime, don't forget to stay on, on the, the road, road to freedom. freedom. says, but you are a chosen generation, That's right. a royal priesthood, yes. a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of Hallelujah. darkness into his marvelous light. You know, one version says he did this so that we would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. I love that because that's I why do we do On the Road to Freedom is so that we can broadcast His love around the world. And you can be a part of helping us share the love of God by joining Team Milan. You just go to Milan.org and click on Team Milan today. And you pray about what God wants you to do. He'll talk to you. He'll show you exactly. Yes. We need your prayers. We need your financial support. We will change the world with God's help and with your help, one person at a time.